Dr. Thiers, Barbara, it's very kind of you to give us some time and I really appreciate it. I wish I, I don't actually have a script. I became acquainted with your work, as you know, through Mike Balick at the New York Botanical Garden and then your wonderful book, Herbarium, which has quickly ascended to one of my favorite books in the library. Oh it's it's a tremendous so piece of work. In my opinion, it's not only beautiful, but informative. And it's a wonderful way to tell the world about the importance of herbaria. And as you know, we're working on a small project, nothing like on the scale of what you've done at the New York Botanical Garden to try to restore this uh, herbarium in Iquitos, Peru, mm -hmm. whose main virtue is that it's in the middle of the heart of biodiversity. Absolutely. I guess what I would like you to do is tell us something about how you came to be involved in this. Mm -hmm. What was the attraction for you? Because I think people don't understand what herbaria even are. You have to explain. A botanical garden, clearly. Yes. Mm -hmm. An herbarium. What's an herbarium and why is it important? Herbarium, in a way, it's a bit like a library of dried plant specimens. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit different than a library because the goal of a herbarium is to, to document the wide range of plant biodiversity. It's the botanical equivalent of a museum that has dinosaur bones or skins of animals. The herbarium originated in the 16th century in Italy by a man named Luca Ghini who was looking for a way to teach his students about the medicinal properties of plants. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, the, the work people generally used, they went back to the classical authors, the many translations of Dioscorides and so forth. But he had the idea that he would make plant collections and put them in a book, and the students could look at the actual thing and study it. It's mm -hmm. very much a Renaissance idea. It's, it's about the time they started using cadavers to teach medical students. So it was all very much a Renaissance idea that we'll learn by actually examining real things. And originally the herbaria were mostly just collections of some specimens in a book. But when Linnaeus came along, the, the man who was responsible for developing our kind of approach to naming things and classifying them, he began to get um, specimens from all over the world, and the book format no longer worked because he wanted to put like things together. So once they were glued in the pages of a book, you couldn't rearrange them when you got new things. Right. So he came up with the idea of these flat sheets of, of plants, where plant is glued, and they're sitting on a, a shelf. And the idea really caught on uh, a lot because of the exploration of the world um, by Europeans and the 18th and 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, there were already, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as a million herbarium specimens. And um, it was very much a European phenomenon. The, mm -hmm. it, it did not originate in other parts of the world where there were very impressive and long-standing traditions of plant knowledge. But those were done mostly through books and illustrations and, and not, you know, not through herbarium specimens. We don't really know why. Herbaria still serve the purpose of being a, the, the reference for determining the identity of a plant and also what characteristics distinguish it from others. And there are today, there are about 3,400 herbaria in the world that collectively hold about 400 million specimens. 400 million, 400 million specimens, specimens oh, collectively. God. Yeah, as best we know. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, essentially, every country except the two or three I can think of um, have herbaria. I manage an index to the herbaria of the world, and we add almost 100 herbaria every year. So it is a growing enterprise. It's a fairly low-tech method of tracking plant biodiversity as long as the specimens are kept flat and dry and free from insects. They tend to last almost indefinitely. So it seems to me from the perspective of a non-herbarium person but who, who respects what herbaria are all about is that herbaria 
are important. They're important in many ways, but they provide a kind of a, a temporal map yes. of a history of the of the flora of a place. Yes, as well as uh, you know a, 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 a usage in mm -hmm. some ways. They yes. provide uh, profiles on on the usage and geographically. Mm -hmm. So those kind of axes of uh, of information make these things make herbaria you know quite valuable resources yes. that i think they're underappreciated and definitely yes they are underappreciated there's sort of the idea of this as being and it's really true for all museum collections as being sort of quaint artifacts of the past mm -hmm. They often, often when you talk about any kind of collections, the word dusty comes up as if right. these things are, are not really used. They're just, you know, mementos of something, right. which is, you know, ridiculous. And it, it's infuriating um, because certainly... This could be said of many libraries. Well, that's know, true. A library. Yes, that's true. Dusty volumes, but it right. doesn't diminish its value. No, and and library, uh, herbaria are, are used constantly. I don't have any records beyond the New York Botanical Garden, but we had 2,000 days worth of visitors from often as many as 60 different countries in the course of a given year, and people travel to... We now digitize specimens so people can look at them online, but mm -hmm. you can't really, you, you know, you can't dissect an image. You can't really use them. So right. People still need to travel to to view them. And herbaria, beyond it, it, because of how they're preserved and how they're maintained, there's a lot of other uses that have come up. In the 1990s, it was determined that you could get DNA from from herbarium specimens, mm -hmm. and at first, it was only recent ones, and you didn't get very much, and it wasn't very good, but that's been refined greatly. And as it turns out, when we get to doing whole genome sequences, herbarium specimens are sort of pre-adapted for that because the DNA is already kind of broken up into little pieces, which is the first thing you do when you do genomic sequences. You break the DNA up and then put it back together. So what that means is that people can make comparisons on grand scales about about a wide range of plants at a much smaller cost than if they had to go and collect them or find them in the field. In many cases, probably, that many species don't even exist. Anymore. Exactly. Some of these species are extinct. Right. So right. Right. Herbaria is a bridge to the past, as right. you say. I mean, right. we think of it as this 19th century, you know, Victorian, mm -hmm. kind of the spoils of uh, yes. exploration yep. and all this. And mm -hmm. I mean, they're criticisms leveled at it. But on the other mm -hmm. hand, you know, a point that I'm making in my presentation here at the conference is that herbaria are exemplary of something that science does that doesn't really get appreciated, which is observation. Right. And we think of science as experimental. Right. But a equally important part of it is exploration. Like, right. what's out there? Exactly. You know, and herbaria are a place where this, these discoveries can be documented. Right. And as you say, now with the DNA technology and other types of technology, they're far from a quite relic of the 19th century. I mean, exactly. they're very relevant to what is right. going on, particularly right. with respect to climate change and, and all of those factors. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, they're a lens on those processes. Right. Yes. And now that we have so many data that are digitized, you can look at them on just larger scales than you ever could before. And you can begin to develop, if you know where plants grew, and you can put that point on a map with using GIS technology, yep. you can characterize where it lives. And then you can begin to make projections about with climate change, how might the distribution of species change? Right. So right. species modeling is greatly empowered by these vast quantities of data. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is, is, you know, each plant has its own cycle for when it flowers and fruits and so forth. And that's very closely linked to its pollinators and to the animals that disperse it. Right. One of our great fears of climate change is that we'll be disrupting those cycles, those very you know, finely tuned cycles. And, and we can study using herbarium sheets, which generally present a plant with flower or fruit because those are key features for identification. We can, um, we know when and where it was collected and we can look over time to see how 
flowering and fruiting patterns are changing. Yeah, And indeed, exactly. you know, they are. And then you can also then correlate that with insect uh, collections with, you know, bees and things like that. Exactly. Uh, or, um, yeah. It's not... So it becomes much more than just a li um, dusty library Absolutely. of dried plant specimens. Yeah. It's actually a window into the past. Yes. And a window into the future, in a sense, yes, or the indeed. presence because of yes. climate change right. and all of this. Tell me, what brought uh, what you brought me into, into this? How did you get it? <laughs> I mean, I take it your degree is in botany. It is. And it's, it's not the typical path. So my father was um, a mycologist, studied um, uh, macrofungi, mushrooms. And he was the curator, founder and curator of the herbarium at San Francisco State University, where he worked for his more than 40 years. And as a kid, I spent a lot of time going in, on field trips. Most of my weekends and things were collecting mushrooms. But then there was also the, the preservation of the specimen side of it. And I think mostly to get me out of my mother's hair, he would <laughs> take me on weekends to the herbarium and I could help out. And so I, you know, I helped him do a variety of things. And up until the time I was a teenager, I, I put in a lot of time helping him. I loved hanging around his students. They're often, you know, the people who go into these fields are often motivated in a variety of ways, but they're often kind of interesting people. And I, yeah, I love being around them, you know. Fairly eccentric. Ex fairly eccentric. <laughs> but yeah, in a good quite, way. Yeah, in a yeah. good way. Yeah. And they were, yeah, they were all very passionate about pursuing their interest in natural history and biodiversity. Um, and of course, I drifted away in high school. I wanted nothing more to do with any of that. But I found my way back because the people I knew who seemed happiest in what they did on a day-to-day -day basis were people who were, again, you know, pursuing a study of natural history in, in, in some way. And so I thought that's the kind of life I would like to have. Now, the herbarium may or may not have figured into my long-term plans, but I was particularly interested in bryophytes and mosses and liverworts. And because they, because nobody seemed to study them much, I got interested mm -hmm. and I went and I found someone who would direct my PhD work on that. And when I was done, I was offered a few teaching jobs, but what intrigued me the most was a postdoctoral fellowship at the New York Botanical Garden because I knew they had a fabulous herbarium. And in the particular groups that I was interested in, no one had touched those collections in many years. So mm -hmm. I went for a, a one-year postdoc and I ended up staying. It was nothing like my dad's little herbarium, was, you know, of maybe he had 60,000 specimens. This was seven million and it was on a totally different scale and right before i knew it i was completely captivated with the challenge of of this collection at that time though when i when i went there there was a huge effort in partnership with the brazilian government to document the floor of the amazon and so there were people coming and going all the time on expeditions there were many brazilian botanists around the whole time it was a very exciting thing to be engaged in and a part of the project that was supposed to happen, it was way before its time, was to be digitizing all of these collections, making a big computer database of all the flora of Brazil. But nobody, nobody this was in the, uh, this was in the early 1980s, and nobody really knew how. Nobody to do was that. doing that. Nobody, you know, everybody knew what we wanted, but there was, there was just an obstacle around every corner. Right. But so that kind of became my thing to figure out at New York how could we, how could we employ computers to capture information, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I so, loved it. So you came into the New York Botanical Garden mm -hmm. and through, I take it, several steps, you mm -hmm. became the director yes. of the herbarium, mm -hmm. yeah. which was already huge and mm -hmm. there was a huge infrastructure, but the virtual herbarium mm -hmm. is kind of your creation. Right, right. right? I mean, you... Yeah had this vision to create this virtual herbarium and now everybody does it but back right. in the day it was yeah. uh, you know you were a pioneer <laughs> it was very How much a hit or twist i mean my well something that that immediately comes to mind is given the challenges that we're facing mm -hmm. how did you fund this thing I mean, so, <laughs> you know, that was where the New York Botanical, being in the New York Botanical Garden came in handy. At about the same time that we, that I was beginning to imagine how this could be done. I really, you know, I, I had played around with a bunch of databases that you could 
purchase and I, I, you know, I figured out how to do it. I knew what I was doing wouldn't scale for the whole thing, but I, I got a little, I, I learned some programming. I got a little experience under my belt, enough that I knew what we wanted. We happened to have a new president of the garden, Gregory Long, came to us from the, uh, from the art world. He was, he was keen to make a big splash for himself at the garden and for all of us. And he wanted big ideas. You know, what should we do? And I said, we should, we should digitize the herbarium. I mean, in, in stages. And right. he had, you know, being a new, a new CEO, he, there were donors who were interested in supporting these sorts of things. So I think our first money uh, was from a private foundation. I don't remember which one now, but it was enough to get us, uh, to get us started. And what we really needed was a computer expert, you know, somebody who kind of knew how sure. to build this. Right. And we had, you know, funds for a few years to get started and, you know, fits and starts. It took a while, but I had the support of the gardens administration because this ended up being one of the big ideas that arose from the first strategic plan that we did with this new CEO. So the timing was, was right then the National Science Foundation was really the main funder of this. Mm -hmm. I think we got our first grant in maybe the mid 90s. Oh, we also had, um, we also developed, um, we, we're very keen on taking pictures of these things and yep. digital photography, you know, we pay our first camera, I think we paid $20,000 for pictures that aren't nearly as good as you get on your phone these days. But you know, right. we, again, <laughs> we, had, we had the help of the Xerox Foundation in that case who helped us figure out how to take pictures of things. And then there was the challenge of how to put them online. But the approach we always took was, let's just try it. Let's try it on a small scale and we'll learn from it. And then we'll, you know, we'll step back and we'll see if there's a way to do it better. So with some luck um, and a vision of what this could be, one of the main reasons that motivated me uh, was the idea of repatriating data. And I had Brazil specifically in mind, but it would work for any place because, of course, you know, the colonial history of how science and museums developed. There were early days when things were taken and very little was given back. Yes. Um, but I, I was very profoundly affected by the partnership that the garden developed through this Progetto Flora Amazonica project of the 1980s and how it really was meant to be an equal partnership. And I don't know. I, I hope it was. I don't. I wasn't really inside enough, but certainly it seemed to be a partnership. But I realized all the Brazilian scientists who came to New York, they were seeing their own plants. They were, the, you know, the history of their own plants. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we could have decided. To what just, are these doing here? Right, How come right. they're not? I mean, we could have just given them back. You know, yes. I mean, that would have been one solution. But instead, we didn't. What we did was we said, let's let's take pictures of them and make them available. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, I mean, I still think there's a, a strong reason for repatriating specimens. The thing about botanical specimens is many of them are collected in duplicate. So right. they're, the, one of the innovations of Progetto Flora was that for every plant collected, there would be half of, half of all the material would stay in Brazil and the other half would go to other institutions. And even in the early days, even in the 19th century explorations, there were, you know, duplicates of these specimens made. But I still think an excellent project would be to make sure that of everything that was ever collected in Brazil, that at least one representative resides in Brazil and maybe more. I think our problem would be finding them all <laughs> among the world's herbaria. But, yeah. but I still think it would be a worthwhile thing to do. But it was all really about sharing back this knowledge. It does seem that there are aspects of it that are overwhelming in terms mm -hmm. of there is so much to document. Right. For example, with this little herbarium in Iquitos yes. that we're approaching, you know, I've had a relationship with the curator for over 50 years. You know, I mean, he was a student when I was a student, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. met in 1981, and we've kept working together, and he eventually became the curator of the herbarium. Mm -hmm. But the herbarium... You know, I mean, it's it's problematic largely because of lack of funding, sure, and sort yeah. of general neglect, and yeah. and a lot of uh, you know sort of perception at the university level that this is a waste of time. And why are we spending resources? Right. Well, they're not. But yeah. <laughs> so the situation with the 
a ketos herbarium is that, you know, it has 150,000 specimens, wow. but only 50,000 have actually been mounted and cataloged and entered yeah. into the... So what we're trying to do, this daunting task of unpack those yeah. other 100,000 specimens right. and somehow get those integrated into yeah. the collection. Yeah. I envision this happening through armies of work-study students, yeah. basically. Yeah. If we can get the funds, mm -hmm. there are students sure. that could do this work, and, and they do. And that's going to be a huge project. And, you know, we're trying to raise about $10 million mm -hmm. for this, mm -hmm. which I think in the people say, my God, $10 million. But actually, that's a small amount mm -hmm. compared to what it must have taken to create the CV star herbarium, for example. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I ever really totaled it up, but I know I know we had well over um, 10 million in NSF funds alone, So, and that's not counting all the private money that, that we were raising. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, this is where having yeah. the New York Botanical Garden, mm -hmm. you know, behind you is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tremendous... Right. Uh, you know, right. vehicle for, for right. raising funds because right. they have the reputation. Right, right. But I would think that many philanthropists, people that want to support the botanical garden, you have to kind of convince them, to say, okay, you've got the living collections, and those are wonderful, mm -hmm. but you have to convince yep. them, see the value of the herbarium. Right. They're not as exciting. Right. But they're in some ways maybe more important than right. the living collections because the... Yeah. Absolutely. The, the, it becomes a bit abstract because the real value of herbarium data is in the aggregate. Yes. We used to always give tours and show people, oh, I don't know, a specimen collected by Darwin or a specimen collected by some other famous person. Right. And and those are the kind of the wow factor, you know, yep. it's an interesting artifact. But it wasn't, you know, wasn't really telling the value of them because it's, it, it, it's the value of all of them together. And in Iquitos, it's the value of that 150,000 altogether. I'm sure you can pick out individual specimens that are critical. But oh, and I value. have many times, right, you know, right. to demonstrate to yeah, people. Yeah. Specimens that I collected or mm -hmm. Al Gentry or Richard yes, Schultes or sure. yeah, oh, all of goodness. these famous names. Right. But most right. of that work, most of the work was done by botanists who, for one reason or another, they made those collections and... They were not famous, right? You know, exactly. but the work that they did, as you say, in yeah. aggregate, mm -hmm. it's very important, right? You know, how do we get well. the, how do we educate the public to understand this mm -hmm. and realize, you know, how important this is for all sorts of right issues right, right. now, you know, evolution and climate change and yeah. and the whole historicity of it too, right? You know, right. The evolution. Well. I find that people are, are generally quite interested in herbaria. People like museums. They like to go behind the door. They like to see things. What they what you need is is some stories, you know, some stories with those very specimens that tell a story that, you know, that is relevant to those people. Plants that grow in a place that's not, uh, doesn't have any vegetation anymore because it's been all cut down for one thing or another. That's kind of a sad story. Right. But the people, too, the stories behind the people are captivating. And in a time when we're trying to emphasize the contributions of the less well-known people, especially those in developing country, I imagine there are fabulous stories about some of the people who collected those specimens. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and those could be quite engaging for folks. It takes a little work up front to develop these these stories. Another one that you can often tell is the relationship between a flower and whatever pollinates it. You know, it's it, captivating people in small groups. It doesn't you don't get thousands at a time right. um, and to introduce them to to these things and the university administration. Oh, we, you know, administrators don't know what they have. They don't know the power of it. Right. Another thing, they don't understand the value, the educational value of these herbarium specimens. You mentioned an army of work study students. And yes, that's probably the type of labor that um, that they'll be able to, to get at the price they need to get it for. But those students are having the opportunity to learn a tremendous amount yeah. um, about the botany of them because perhaps they'll be asked to sort of verify and who knows what the label data are or like? They may have to check some things. So they're learning 
botanical nomenclature. They're learning geography. They're learning just the process, the basic process of science documentation. And if done right, if those students, you know, have a little freedom to do their own sort of creative projects with some of the things that they work with, this is a, a fabulous way to get students to use, um, to, to sort of a, have an approach to data science even, where yeah. what they're working with is far more interesting than actuarial data or, you know, mm -hmm. demographic data, the kinds of examples that are often used. Right, well, at least there's something physical yes. that they can relate yes. it to. And they can, yeah. they can ask yeah. a question. I mean, we've done project with high school students, which get them to kind of go through the process of determining whether a species is rare based on where it occurs and how many there are, you know, and it's very adaptable. It, it takes a little work up front, you know, to kind of decide what are the kinds of questions that are appropriate to be, be answered. But I would think with a little time and effort, this could be touted as a, an educational opportunity that, you know, really couldn't be had anywhere else. Right. Uh, especially because of where it is, yes. you know, if yes. the possibility to link work with mm -hmm. the herbarium with mm -hmm. work in the field absolutely you know yeah. and uh, because you know you walk out the door of the herbarium and you're in the middle of the amazon yeah you know well, yes i mean you're in the middle of a quitos but right an hour or so up the river right you may as well be yeah you know it's, it's it can get quite wild and mm -hmm. quite remote yeah quickly and so I'm sure there's so in that sense so i'm trying to you know, make people appreciate this, that the herbarium mm -hmm. with our Biognosis project, what that embodies is the idea that this is, this is a place where science and folk knowledge, traditional knowledge can yes. come together. Absolutely. We want to create the herbarium as a nexus for mm -hmm. this information exchange mm -hmm. and make it relevant to the people in the in these communities, you know, because... Yes. They're immersed in the world of plants. Right. They depend on plants That's for right. everything. Medicines, yep. foods, clothing, mm -hmm. dye, you name it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're not really, I mean, this is just their daily life. Right. Other people don't realize this. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do with the herbarium is, is create a, a place where those elements of the plant world become apparent mm -hmm. and then help those people also to appreciate, you know, the scientific value right. of, of their knowledge and create ways for them to share that knowledge. Yes. If they choose if to. If they choose to. Also yeah. respecting, say, right. you know, you don't have to disclose anything that you right. feel you, right. that your people, your, your people would rather not spread to the world. Right. But right. what you can disclose this will be a mechanism to do that. And hopefully we can enlist the, the cooperation of different botanical mm -hmm. gardens, museums, and so on. Yes. Of course, the New York Botanical Garden, the Missouri Botanical Garden yes. is another yeah. institution that's very strong in South America. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, I have immense respect for Al Gentry. It's such a pity that he Tragedy. passed on, yeah. you know, so... We're kind of, you know, wondering how can we approach this? We are, you know, we're a nonprofit. We're, we don't have any real institutional chops, mm -hmm. you know, uh, behind us. And the question is, how can you approach people and potential funders and make them appreciate right. the value of what's in this? or barium, right. because if you go and look at it, it right. looks like kind of a mess, <laughs> and it is in some ways. <laughs> I mean, you know, you see the, the catalogs, you yeah. know, the mounted specimens, but then you also see the rooms full of boxes and bags of right. collections that right. some go back 30 years or more. Yeah, no, I know. I know that pack. very well. <laughs> and there's, yeah, yeah you... you yeah. And there's no telling what shape these specimens are in. They could have all been eaten eat. by bugs by this time and uh yeah hopefully not i mean the the it, what you're telling me reminds me a lot back in the day of what the collection was like at the uh, university in bogota you know they had tons and tons of of backlog what they did was train up a bunch of botanists you know who could identify them and and right. there are now there are resources in 
neighboring countries, there is a quite a lot of smart young botanists who are much closer by. Yeah. Um, I would think two things. It would be extremely attractive to many tropical botanists to go and see what's there. So you might get people to come even on their own dime because they'd like a way in and they'd like to see what's been collected. Mm -hmm. So that would be one way. There are also, you know, bringing in, um, uh, like I say, people who've kind of been through this from Columbia especially because they really have upped their game in terms of care of their collections in the past 20 or 30 years. Right. Learn from that experience. It's of huge interest internationally, worldwide, about how to incorporate in indigenous knowledge into a variety of things, you know, whether it's um, climate change, uh, land form change over time, but also very much in terms of, of biodiversity. Right. And finding out how, but it's not, a, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky ethically, but we're assuming, you know, we're talking about people who are willing to share at least some aspects of their knowledge. How exactly to do that? You know, how how, how to structure it? Um, and I know Missouri Botanical Garden is actually doing quite a lot of, of work on this. So there's an interesting question from the point of view of not just biology, but, but anthropology, linguistics, and so forth about right. recording these, and actually just data science in general. So that's another angle that it might be possible to get some interest in. I mean, to me, and maybe it's my own bias, but the idea that this could be a way to train local students in techniques that are you know, going to be key, it's the people on the ground in those places that are going to have to be the ones who make the decisions about what gets conserved and what's not. Right. And we can, we can help all we like, but it's their place and their decisions, their livelihoods. If, if the more we can do, the more we could use collections, herbarium collections to increase their knowledge and appreciation of the local flora, you know, that's right. probably the most important thing we can do. This fits very well with the objectives of our our project is to, you know, in addition to documenting the specimens, we want to make a series of documentaries, kind of a snapshot of the current state of traditional medicine in the Amazon and mm -hmm. these communities in the Loreto area mm -hmm. that are, you know, kind of the collection area for the herbarium because mm -hmm. they have been impacted by all the other forces that are impacting everything everywhere. Right. Climate exactly. change is sure. mainly climate change, but then we've got globalization and you know all the issues around indigenous intellectual property in mm -hmm. Peru particularly. There's also, you know, ayahuasca tourism, which has had tremendous impact. Some of sure. it good, some of it not so good. Right. So, and yet these communities thrive mm -hmm. and, or, well, they continue to exist anyway. Mm -hmm. What I try to illustrate in my presentation is every specimen tells a story. Every specimen has a story behind it. Mm -hmm. At least somebody somewhere felt that it was important to collect that specimen mm -hmm. and document it. Yeah. You know, sometimes you don't get much more than that. Sometimes, right. as you well know, you get the deeper levels of information. Mm -hmm. So we want to bring those stories together yes. and make those real to people. Mm -hmm. And then re people can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And that's where this gentleman that is the curator of the herbarium becomes so important. Mm -hmm. Because this guy has, you know, he grew up in the Quitos. He's been a botanist for most of his life, but he also yeah. has been very much out in the field. He knows the people. I mm -hmm. wouldn't call him a medicine man per se, mm -hmm. as we think of a curandero or something. Yeah. He probably has more knowledge in his head than most medicine men do, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. he's got the science. Sure. He's got one foot in science, yeah. one foot in traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. He's one of these people about whom it's said, when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library is burned down. Yeah. He is the library. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. he never writes anything down. He does not <laughs> think this way. Yeah. So one thing that we want to do in making these documentaries is just do these in-depth interviews with Juan about yeah. yeah in the field in the herbarium talking about the plants that he feels are mm -hmm. 
interesting to him mm -hmm. and talk about stories and mm -hmm. thought lists. I mean, every, yeah. every, he can <laughs> select a, a specimen out of the herbarium and he'll tell you not only what it is and maybe what it's used for and so on, but usually has a story or two about some botanist uh -huh. 20 years ago that came <laughs> yeah. through, and it's some, often very some, funny. Some you know? stupid gringo who came and what yeah. they did, and yeah. So we want to we want to make that real. You know, mm -hmm. we want to document one's yeah. knowledge through videography, and That's eventually maybe produce a book, but maybe mm -hmm. maybe not. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the Amazonian Ethnobotanical Dictionary, which you're probably familiar mm -hmm. with. It's mm -hmm. it's long been out of print. There needs to be an updated Update, sure. version of that. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the most valuable books in my library. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. it's, my yeah. copy is well over 30 years old, maybe 40 years yeah. old by now. Yeah. 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 Well, it's clearly a treasure on many different levels. Yeah. I don't, so it, the, the story is just getting, you know, the message out there because I don't, you know, there's no question and I do think, I think the, the, the South American in general, botanical community would be, would be happy to be helpful. You know, there is the Latin American Botanical Congress. There used to be several her networks of, herbar of Latin American herbaria, of people who've been doing this for many years and who, who may have gone through the very same kind of struggles, both for appreciation and for what's needed to actually, uh, you know, do the updating. So... There is a great community. I've been very impressed. Um, years ago, we used to have meetings of um, Latin American herbaria. Um, the, the Mellon Foundation was funding the digitization of specimens, and they were very generous, and they brought people together. And one day, they just gave everybody who wanted to the chance to get up and talk about their herbarium, uh, and they, all Latin American curators. And it was the most inspiring day I've ever spent because they're all Imagine. facing challenges. I would love, were any yeah. of those lectures recorded? Those no. Presentations? no, we didn't have the foresight to do didn't that. Didn't think about no, that. We didn't yeah. do that. Yeah. But everybody, you know, making well, do with what they have. And so it's... It, in terms of funding, as we've tried to secure funding for this, you know, we've been focusing on basically private individuals yeah. who, mm -hmm. for one reason or another, they want to, you know, they're often it, there's the psychedelic angle, you know, okay. and people yeah. want to fund things related to that. Mm -hmm. So then when you step back from that and say, well, this isn't, this is sort of not really about psychedelics. This mm -hmm. is about plants in general. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, should we, uh, our efforts to get the enthusiasm of private philanthropists have not turned out to be so good. You know, we haven't gotten the response, and I'm wondering, should we be focusing on forming alliances or partnerships with some of these other institutions, well, that be... looking at different grant sources and yeah. so on? Yeah. And the thing is, for the McKenna Academy as a small nonprofit, we don't have the cachet, we don't have the track record that... Uh, you know, the New York Botanical Garden, or the Missouri Botanical <laughs> yeah. Garden. Have, yeah. These yeah. are established institutions that have probably a, a, right. a pool of people that want to continuously right. support them. We'd like to get to that place, have but you, I'm not sure how you do that. Have you had a conversation with Peter Raven about this? Uh, at the New York Botanical no, Garden? No, Peter Raven is the former head of the Missouri Botanical Garden, and he's... Oh, he stepped down now. It's at least 10 years ago. But he is somebody who generally knows how to figure out, you know, knows how to connect people. Um, and he's passionate about projects like the one you're talking about. I, I yeah, think I, I need to be talking. Um, I, I will give, I will make sure you get his contact. I'll introduce you. Know, you. I would love um, to talk with him. Because I, he, he. I think this is what we need. We need to yeah. get some institutional alliances. And then yeah. we need to get, you know, enough funding to uh, effectively not so much do the project, but write the proposals, which right. will be complicated and expensive right. to produce and make a very detailed map mm -hmm. of where we want to go mm -hmm. and then present that mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, excite enthusiasm for right. people that want to support right. that kind of thing. So Peter would have been the one who raised the money for Al Gentry to do a lot of the work that he did. He was Al Gentry's boss. 
Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he, he and he, he and you know, the Missouri it. Botanical Garden has a close relationship to the one in Iquitos. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sort of took it under its wing back yeah. in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. They even built a new building for it. They, oh, you know, I okay. mean, they tremendously upgraded it. Yeah. But then when yeah. Al Gentry died, it yeah. sort of fell away, yeah. Yeah. you know, because he was there. Going. He was constantly pushing for it. Right. Right. And it's sort of, you know, it's sort of just withered once he was gone. Yeah. Yeah. And they still have the building and mm -hmm. so on, the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But to mount these additional 100,000 specimens, yeah. it's going to probably yeah. have to build a new building, which is right. where, or add a couple floors to the existing one, right. which is where some of the, this $10 million will come from. Right. I don't know if that's what it's going to take. But, uh, well, as I say, I've always been a big fan of the pilot project. If there is, if they can identify a small piece and try to generate some interest, and in, and in show some some real benefits to the students, obviously to the collections before and after what they look like in the newspaper and how nice they look, how they are contributing to um, gaps in the knowledge. Maybe, you know, maybe, but it it again it will take a little effort to figure out like where to start and what to start with. You have to be very strategic. I wouldn't pick a random bundle of plants to work on. I'd see if they can, if they know if they have specimens by Al Gentry or by somebody else that's, that, that they know were collections that were made to fill a particular taxonomic or geographic, you know, gap. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just uh, start small. I'll see if you, and then, you know, see if you can generate some, some larger interest from that. So that would be, you know, that would that would be my uh, one suggestion. Yeah. You might interest you might interest a foundation or an individual in a pilot project, which with the possibility of scaling up. Um, once the data are captured, they could be shared, you know, internationally through the Global Biodiversity Institute if they were interested. There are all sorts of ways that these data once you know. Once the plants are mounted and you put the information in a database that suddenly these are part of, you know, what the world can this use. This becomes part of the yeah. body of knowledge that's right. accessible to the world. Yes. And that's, that's, what, uh, yeah. that's what we want to do with the herbarium and the ketosis. Yeah. Make it part of that yeah. information pool mm -hmm. rather than something off to the side here that nobody's heard of and nobody really cares about. Right. Because it's... It's so important just because of the place yeah. that see it. Oh, absolutely. You know. Yeah. I, I actually think people there would be a lot of people interested to help. Maybe an article and think about like where, where you might reach. It just, you know, kind of, because I, I think if most people are like me, they knew there was a herbarium there. They knew it was an important herbarium. They haven't heard anything about it in a while. It's just yeah. kind of fallen out of their, you know, their thinking. But um, the herbarium community internationally is very supportive and close-knit. And if there's a herbarium in trouble, people will try to find a way to help, you know? So there could yeah. be, there could be. So maybe, maybe a good idea would be to uh, have like a two or three day symposium on this. Yeah. And it could Absolutely. be virtual or otherwise. Uh -huh. Bring uh -huh. some curators in, bring yes. people like yourself and mm -hmm. Peter Raven and other people that have worked in neotropical yeah. botany. Yeah. And, uh, and try to make this real for people. Mm -hmm. you right, know, right. What we're finding is in this climate particularly, it's just hard to raise money for a nonprofit. You know? Oh, holy and, me. And I'm, <laughs> you know. And it's one reason I retired, quite frankly, I was tired of raising money. <laughs> right. So I totally understand. <laughs> um, right, but you but, succeeded. You you yeah. created this CV Star Herbarium, yeah. which is one of the top virtual herbarium in the world, if not the top virtual herbarium in, in the world. And it, it's so, you know, it, it's all by all by luck and by happenstance, though. I mean, really. Well, you know. luck and happenstance, but then you had the vision that guided this yeah. thing. I mean, I oh. know you had many collaborators yes. Yes. and so on. Yeah, I'm a big fan of having a vision, and and the more that can be articulated about exactly you know what deliverables will come from this, I think we all know. But to to the larger audience of funders, they don't necessarily know. Right. There is a sense. Mm -hmm. among people, you know, people in funding, that that 
putting money into something like this is sort of a bottomless pit. It's just gonna, <laughs> you know. And I mean, I've heard pe donors have told me, yeah, I'll give you a million. And then two years later, you're going to want another million. And well, you know, when's it going to be done? And and of course, there there is really no answer yeah. to that question. It's well, not going. The fact is, they're right. It is. They a are. Of say it yeah. is. <laughs> because... the app, it is. And I always those conversations made me very uncomfortable. Right. But we're building a something that is meant to last forever, forever and ever and ever. And every collection, whether you like to say this or not, every collection you add is going to add some work that is going to have to be maintained right. in perpetuity. It's, but. Again, there can be and there should be clear-cut deliverables and, and clear-cut goals, short-term goals. And we have to just recognize that what we see as the questions the herbarium can answer today um, may change in a number of years. And then we may be asking different questions. We may be using a lot of AI. We may be doing very different things. But yeah. it's, it's indisputable that having actual biological material from the past that's being maintained and preserved is ir an irreplaceable resource. So right. even though the questions may change, uh, we, we know it will be... A questions may change, but the resource will be there to support that's those right. questions. That's right. Well, this is, this is a very interesting conversation because, you know, I mean... Like, as you say, the philanthropists will say, well, you want a million dollars mm -hmm. next year, you'll want another million. When will it be done? Right. This is not a building that you're making. Right. This is exactly. not a statue. Right. You're, you're supporting a process. Right. You're supporting. So the answer is it really doesn't come to an end no. because it's an active institution that's doing things. That's right. And it needs ongoing support. But it also has ways to uh, generate its own revenues. Right. You know, once you get right. to a certain stage, yes. then yes. you can generate revenues through mm -hmm. like partnerships with mm -hmm. educational institutions, Absolutely. botanical gardens, and so yes. on to to create educational programs mm -hmm. that that brings this stuff to the world. Right. That brings it. It's so much. It's a, so, such a tougher sell than say dinosaurs oh yes something like yes that. it absolutely is but um, it's important i mean dinosaurs right. are gone right <laughs> you exactly. know yeah. plants are here kind of ironic we could still save some of the plants the dinosaurs there's no hope but people yeah, were interested exactly. in that exactly. um, but you know there's no end to knowledge there's no end to what we can learn from these things but there are short-term spin-offs of things like you say um that that uh that can that will help us in very material ways. And there's nothing more pressing right now than climate change in a place like Iquitos, where, you know, in the Amazon... It, it, it's a laboratory to study this. Exactly. exactly. And the interactions and herbaria are the basis for conservation decisions and conservation science in many ways. There's still a lot to explore about exactly how we turn knowledge into conservation action. Iquitos could be a center for for how to how to do this, how to do, you know, how how to turn this knowledge into actions that will actually conserve part of the forest, where it's where there's nowhere more critical to do it than where they are. Right. right. So there's huge opportunities. You know, I mean, the, as you say, it all begins with getting these plants out of storage and into cabinets so they can be studied. No, that's going to be a long-term project. But your yeah. idea of a pilot project mm -hmm. is. Excellent. I'm not sure how, but this idea of taking a subset mm -hmm. of the collection and saying, you know, for example, Al Gentry's collections, mm -hmm. what, you know, you could right. structure it that way, or right. you could look at a particular family or, mm -hmm. you know, all the, right. all the ways you could look at it, but I'll, I'll bet you you're maybe carve there. off, yeah. you know, I mean, this might fit in with our preoccupation with psychoactive drugs because you could do a survey. Yeah. You know, we do these uh, conferences, the ESPD conferences, the Ethnal Pharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. There you go. So we could build a project based on that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a grant uh, some years ago in the early 90s from the Stanley Medical Research Institute for look at to look at plants with potential to treat dementia mm -hmm. and uh, schizophrenia and mm -hmm. these sorts of things. And so we made some collections we had a database we had all that but that concept could be expanded mm -hmm. you know and that could be a very interesting yeah. way to approach it and yeah. then you might even get money from 
pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. and that, but then you have to be careful of all the you do cooptation yeah. and intellectual property issues. You right. know? But the uh, right. National Cancer Institute has managed to have, you know, they've walked a fine line for many years, mm -hmm. and they managed to respect in indigenous property rights and also advance yeah. investigations. Yeah. So it yeah. can be done. It can yeah. be done. Yeah. You know, yeah. You retired. I did. <laughs> what led What led to that? It sounds well, like you were doing all these exciting things. I, you didn't I just drop no. everything one day and no. move to Denver. The period between 2010 and 2020 was sort of a golden period for Herbaria. The National Science Foundation was putting $100 million into the digitization of natural history collections in the United States, something I, I never in a million years dreamed would happen. But I was, I was able to play a part in helping to set up that program, help give NSF some guidance on how it might be structured and how it might operate. And then um, I was able to, you know, to leverage that to raise quite a lot of money for the garden to, to do that. And that program ended in, in 2020. And we, of course, there's tons more digitization to do, not just at New York, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. But we're sort of moving into a next phase of using those data. And using those data, using artificial intelligence and machine learning and a whole host of new techniques, which are really kind of beyond me. They're fascinating to me. I don't, didn't feel I should be the one to be leading this next, next generation. I, I was able to, to leverage you know, my skills to get the stuff digitized, but I thought it was time. I'm very conscious of making opportunities for up and coming people. So I thought this yeah. is a great place for a new set of folks to step in. Also, I was trained as a botanist. I loved my little liverworts, and I always wanted to get back to doing that. <laughs> I started, I learned them in California, and I wasn't so interested in going back to California, but I wanted to get back to the West. And my daughter happens to live in Denver, my daughter and her husband. So, I, and, and I've had a long-term association with this institution, with the Denver Botanical Garden, which is Botanic Garden, which is a fine example of not just living plants and not just uh, the preserved plants, but of a, of a whole approach to informing people about, you know, plants and their importance and helping them to, you know, grow gardens that are appropriate for this area and right, to learn right. about plants. So it was an institution I was very happy to be associated with. What, what so. do you do here? My first goal, I particularly would like to do uh, a bryophyte flora of Colorado. Um, it, one has been done in, in a kind of a, uh, a first attempt way about 10 years ago. I would like to redo that. But what I'm setting up now is sort of a new concept for herbarium. It's going to be a public access reference collection for bryophytes um, so that the general public can come in with their specimens and they can compare them. We'll make space available for people to do this study because um, a lot of the different land management agencies and parks and public lands are keen to know more about that aspect, uh, but they don't, they don't know them and they're, they're not easy to learn. So creating a reference set of specimens is sort of a, is one step towards unlocking the door for people discovering these organisms. Right. So that's, and, and, but I'm also having a lot of fun going out and collecting them and identifying them. And it's, you know, what I, how I got into this and I've kind of returned to my roots. And I'm still very much involved in the collections community and in the biodiversity data community. Um, I'm part of, I'm a, on the advisory board of the Biodiversity Collections Network, and we are trying to engage with a whole host of data scientists and environmental data to try how we can integrate all the data that we have to answer these very pressing challenges that we face. So I really, I didn't want to, to leave that. I was a little tired of the day-to-day -day grind of raising money. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, you do after a while. Yeah. But, uh, um, but, you know. You, but I'm still passionately a, a supporter of the New York Botanical do you, Garden. Do you have a chance to pursue your own study of bryophytes? Yes, that's what that? I. That's what what what, yeah. what I do here. You know, I was very surprised. Uh, actually, one of my best friends from graduate school days, a, a guy named Terry McIntosh. I was very surprised to learn that Richard Spruce mm -hmm. was actually a bryologist. He, and he, he of course, he's famous in the mm -hmm. world of psychedelics because he's one of the first people that ever 
wrote about ayahuasca right. reported on those right. plants. Right, right. I all I had no idea he was a bryologist. Yeah, see, know? that's how I came to Richard Spruce. Yeah. This is beautiful. <laughs> and beautiful and uh, you know collection. that's 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 very yeah. interesting. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> but this is you produce much food for thought here oh, in terms well. of how how to approach it and uh, and you know you you talked a few minutes ago about how the next generation this is part of our vision too mm -hmm. we we have this idea of bringing once we get a subset or the whole set mm -hmm. whatever whatever their funds for not just digitize the specimens and put them online but then we have this idea for the what we're calling the visionary rainforest which is basically the idea to bring the cutting edge VR and AI ah. technologies to create, to use these specimens to create an immersive in environment in oh, the metaverse. I hate, yeah. That. Yeah. I hate that word, yeah. but in some kind of visual space that you can actually fly through it. You know, with the collections distributed mm -hmm. either based on geography or they mm -hmm. could be collection date or mm -hmm. probably geography. Yeah. And then so you've got these collections and then it becomes much more interactive and mm -hmm. almost like a game almost yeah. to fly through this environment. No, here's uh, these collections are, you know, this, this space is dotted with nodes and each node mm -hmm. is a specimen mm -hmm. and you click yep. the specimen and... Yep. all the data and then all the the uh, other databases that might be associated with it genomic yeah. taxonomic phytochemical and yeah. botanical yeah. yeah yeah make it real yeah you know I mean we have this vision I think well what you've given me is a lot of takeaways <laughs> actually <laughs> I so appreciate that but I think the main takeaway for me as I think about how we try and fund this is, maybe that's what we should be doing, is mm -hmm. select a subset of the herbarium that for whatever reason is of interest to people, mm -hmm. say psychoactive, mm -hmm. there's a broad category, there's all kinds of, sure. and then try and digitize that subset mm -hmm. and then create this virtual environment based on that, mm -hmm. that becomes a demo mm -hmm. and then people can yeah. appreciate that and they'll, the experience will lead to you know, lead people to want to, want to fund it. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the challenge, I think, with the herbarium is if you're outside the field, mm -hmm. you know, you're prone to this idea of who cares about a bunch of dead, dead plants. plants, you know. I know. <laughs> but dead plants are, yeah. I mean, science is basically the yeah. botany. The yeah. botany is basically the science of dead plants. But I, I... I remain convinced that if you can get a little bit of someone's attention and you have got the right specimens and you tell us a good story, you will get them interested. They are inherently interesting. Yeah. If, but they need a little interpretation. I, you know, I've given I've given thousands of tours over the past forty years, and I have rarely, almost never, had not been able to get some glimmer of interest, even from middle school students. So, right. so it, it it it's you know it it takes a little showmanship and a little, you know, um, a little effort to get the story and to get a, a succinct story that is anybody can follow. But um, but I I think I think it can be done. I Does the uh... Denver Botanical Garden have an herbarium? They do. Of course they, they do. They do. They have a herbarium that's focused mostly on Colorado. They have a herbarium of plants and they have a herbarium of fungi, both of which are excellent, especially the fungi. I think there's there's certainly no, nothing comes close to documenting the, the fungi of the central Rocky Mountain region like, like this herbarium does. Begun by a physician who was a hobbyist and in his spare time began to work, but made excellent collections, wrote a number of books and was a, a recognized authority. And um, the flowering plant herbarium, again, started by a woman who was not trained in the field, but had an excellent eye and dedication, Catherine Kalmbach. And then, and today this herbarium um, is the basis for the floor of Colorado, which is produced by the curator, Jen Ackerfield, really? which is used by uh, essentially everyone who has a need to identify plants in Colorado, which turns out is 
quite, range, quite, a, few, quite a few, more than you might think. Right, right. everyone from rangers uh, to ranchers to um, school kids to a whole to hikers. You know, there's a huge interest in it. So, right. so um, it's a herbarium that, and it also has a huge training component for students and interns, short term and long term employees. In my mind, it's a small herbarium compared to what to what I worked in, but it it does all of the things a herbarium should do mm-hmm. in terms of serving the public, serving science, um, yeah. you know, teaching the next generation. So maybe that's a model for the yeah, herbarium be. and the ketos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, very interesting. I think there must be more questions, but I really appreciate your time and uh, I would like to respectfully ask if you will be a, an advisor to our project. It would be my pleasure. If you would be able to, I would. Uh, we would really appreciate that. I, we, we need guidance, you yeah. know. I'm not, I am a botanist, but sort of not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an ethnopharmacologist, whatever that means. But for this project, uh, I think it would be immensely helpful to have to be able to say we have Dr. Barbara Thiers, you know, who is and who is Barbara Thiers? Well, here's who she is, you know. Well, for whatever that's worth. I For those that know the field, yeah. I think you're uh, you're well well known and well respected. Well, there's nothing that that I'm more committed to than helping Herbaria, and it would be my great pleasure to help. Well, where thank I can. you. Thank so. you. We are going to put well, uh, you know, I'm inspired. I'm going to present on this project of this. There are people in the audience yes. who easily could write a check for the whole thing. Yep. I, I am not expecting that, mm-hmm. but I would be delighted to be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if they can, if they could support just a tenth of it, it would be enough to get started. Just yeah. maybe a pilot project mm-hmm. is the way we should yeah. be framing yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, instead of $10 million. Yeah. Maybe a million dollars. Mm-hmm. A million you know, dollars. That's a more achievable you could goal. Do a lot with a million dollars with this. I mean, you you know, there's there 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 could be some real um, significant outcomes from that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank My you pleasure. so much for My your pleasure. time. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much too. I'm okay. so happy you're here and mm-hmm. still yeah. very active and <laughs> so on. Yeah. So. Fun. You're too busy to go to psychedelic science. That's probably not <laughs> your... I don't have much to contribute there, but um, uh, I'm inter- you know, I'm, I'm it, interested in I'm glad that it's going It's forward. the biggest conference on the topic ever. There are 11,000 people That's there. just m- m- staggering. It is. I, I, <laughs> it, it is. Well, I guess it's good. I yeah, mean, no, I absolutely. Guess, uh, there's there's yeah. a lot of interest in... Yeah in all this and I'm one of the older generations so I'm sort of you know I'm iconic but I'm not contributing much to it anymore mm-hmm. and and my interests actually are more along the lines of this kind of thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know I I think that uh trying to you know really basically bridge these areas of knowledge is the most important thing yes. to preserve the knowledge, the biodiversity, the habitats, yeah. I don't have to tell you yeah. Yeah. all the yeah. things that, uh, you know, yeah. this relates to. So, so thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>